What, what was it that happened on the morning of the 22nd that, that led to this to this battle? Because obviously the two sides had been shadowing one another, both looking for their opening, and it hadn't happened. What, what happened on the morning of the battle to change that? Marmor manages to keep marching from very early in the morning, from about eight o'clock. They're up, you know, it's long days, we're into July, and the French are marching, trying to sweep down from the east to a kind of southwesterly direction, kind of a long curve march. And they see off in the distance a dust cloud, which uh, they probably think is the baggage and Wellington's about to retreat. So they start to march faster, especially at the hedge where they get closer to this dust cloud. But it isn't. It's one of Wellington's divisions. It's the third division, actually, to be specific, under his brother-in-law, Ned Packenham. And they're actually coming in, not marching away. So as they are marching forwards, they start to get strung out with the head of the marching column speeding up and the back still marching at the regular pace. And that causes between the French divisions gaps to appear. This is taking a little while. They actually push in, capture the greater Arapel from um, the Portuguese Cacadors. They just get there beforehand, uh, but they are strong, um, strung out. And this gives us a really famous scene where Wellington's having uh, a quick snack. Uh, I've just got to interrupt here for a moment. For any <laughs> listeners of the podcast, ever since I've known Marcus, he's been wanting to tell me this story of the chicken leg. <laughs> so I can't believe that we're finally at the famous chicken leg moment. So Marcus, please, please take it away with the chicken leg story. With the Salamanca chicken leg. Um, so yeah, here we are. Um, and it was something Wellington did a lot of. He, he ate from the saddle. Uh, normally he ate light snacks. He had um, hard cheese, hard boiled eggs, bread and uh, cold meats in his saddlebag. But we think he just got down off the saddle. This story has been told so many times to different sources. It's always slightly told differently. And he's either sitting down um, with his generals surveying the scene or he's actually stood with his spyglass surveying the land. And he sees this gap and he's eating and he's, looking and he's eating and he's looking and he sees this gap and he asks his aide do you see the gap he says yes he chucks the chicken leg behind his head apparently and goes by god that will do and orders the attacks he orders so everyone off to go and uh, give the various orders and he mounts up himself on copenhagen and dashes off to the third division several miles across the empty uh, plains, outstripping all of his aides to reach uh, the third division to give the order himself. Uh, he's a fantastic horseman. And so then he can then order in this kind of counter sweep. But yes, there's, there's loads of different stories of the chicken <laughs> leg and what people can dive into. Was it actually a chicken leg? Was it cold meat? Or oh, was he sat down or was he still in the saddle? But we're pretty sure he was said something along the lines of, by God, that will do, and did a dramatic gesture uh, with his with his lunch. Well, I'm I'm going to take that opportunity to throw that over to Gareth to see if he thinks that's an apocryphal story, or or did that indeed happen? What do you think? How do you know I was going to question that? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> there is probably some basis behind it, as in he may have been resting, he may have been having a. Uh, you know, sort of a bit of lunch or whatever it was, and something may have occurred. However, I do find it telling that all of the eyewitnesses could not have been there. I haven't found an eyewitness who was actually with him who says anything like it. And that is telling to me in the sense of, you know, did it really happen or was this a bit of a story that went around the troops over the firesides the night after, whatever? Who knows? Um, as I said, I'd like to think there's a little bit of, of, of truth in it and some, some of it's true. Um, you're right, Marcus. I mean, there's so many different versions. I was reading three this morning. One had a chicken leg, one had a piece of beef and the other said he wasn't eating at all. He was drinking. <laughs> so you tell me, you know, by the end of the day. But they all tend to be people who have related it sort of 43rd hand, I think. So I, I, I as a historian, I have to say, I take it. I would like to say it's true, but it's, it's, I take it with a pinch of salt. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, uh, you know, let's not let the truth stand in the way of a good story, as they say. I've heard too many historians saying that as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
So at, at this point, could we say Marmont was being careless? Had he kind of lost control of his divisions at this point? Like, what 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 do you think was responsible for for this gap that led to to Wellington's eureka moment? It's it's un, undoubtedly um, he, the the generals commanding the divisions. I think had actually literally decided themselves what to do next because Marmont was not keeping close control. Uh, and that's why I say that where he, he is not as good at actually implementing as he is at thinking about the strategies. Um, and it, there is a, a lot to sort of say that Tomio, who actually uh, was in the first division there, who charges off and produces his big gap, uh, is almost being too keen to just march in that direction, thinking that he might be able to be uh, perhaps make his name for himself by cutting off a division or something that as they're trying to, as the British are trying to retreat is what, as, as they seem to think was happening at that stage. Um, and as I said, and really at that stage, yeah, Marmont has lost control, but it's almost like he never had the control in the first place because having given out the orders, there's not much evidence of what he was actually doing afterwards. He sort of, he goes up onto the, uh, the greater Arpil and he sort of uh, keeps an eye on the, 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 the fields around, but that doesn't keep an eye on what Tomier is doing way off to the left. So, you know, he, he has very early on lost control of his divisions because they're not following his original orders. And maybe I should let Marcus pick up because you were just in full stride as, <laughs> as, as Wellington showed his amazing horsemanship to race across the battlefield to the third division. Can you pick up what happened next then? So it works really well. Wellington gives the orders directly. Uh, he doesn't actually manage to give them to Ned Packenham, his, his brother-in-law, who's married to Kitty Packenham. Um, but they actually get the order straight to him. Wellington dashes back. And the third division come steaming in, in effect, you know, really are running down across the plains. And they come in um, straight against Tommy Ayer's division in a two deep line. Uh, they, they reform and they, you know, really are a hammer onto the glass, smashing into uh, the French line. Um, basically, bayonets attacking, bayonets fit, sorry, attacking in uh, and going for it. Uh, at the same time, uh, Wellington centre, especially around the 5th Division, engage in a longer musketry duel uh, with the French. And uh, this is where uh, Stapleton Cotton orders Le Marchand, the cavalry commanders, to each other to go in with the heavy cavalry. Uh, we've talked about before about the different types of swords. This is the heavy cavalry, a.k.a. sharp sword. Um, these are the, the big horses, the big men going in and they are starting to sweep through, and they actually push through two lines of French, um, completely shattering uh, battalions, and pushing through and diving through them. He, men who don't have time to form into full defensive squares, and there's, they cause huge casualties, and a large part of uh, the overall casualties are caused over on this left-hand side early on. Wellington's cavalry at Salamanca was a strong force that included five regiments of heavy dragoons whose main purpose was to deliver powerful charges using their weight and esprit de corps. La Marchand, who was allegedly seething at a disrespectful comment made by Stapleton Cotton, led this incredibly successful charge. He was killed in the process. Yeah, he carries on going. He takes uh, a half brigade uh, in and then carries on with the half squadron, so a, a troop, of casual, um, troop of cavalry, right on uh, actually towards the, the far woodland. And uh, he, is, he is shot and um, killed at really close range, uh, which is the end of what would have been a fantastic um, career. And I don't know how much the army really realised this at the, the time that, you know, they'd lost one of their senior commanders um, because it's certainly a blow to kind of the history of the cavalry is saying he, earlier, you know, he, he wrote the book on how to use the swords. He redesigned the swords and he didn't get a lot of chance actually in action. So it's a really unfortunate thing is, you know, any loss in, in battle sadly is. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of one of those what ifs if he carried on where his career would have gone. <laughs> 